Well, welcome again, and thank you so much for joining us online. If you're with us, I ask you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew. I'll begin in chapter 3 in just a moment. At the very end of the chapter, I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. If you missed last week, I would invite you to go and watch my friend, my brother, one of my spiritual mentors, Eddie Sharp, who preached a a wonderful word about not losing heart. And to give you some indication of why I thought that was so significant is because I thought it was important enough for me to show up and listen to Eddie preach at my own church on Sunday morning. It was such a marvelous proclamation of the Word of God. But as we begin this new series, Focus Forward, I was also reminded of the communion talk from last week from my dear friend Monica Simons, who who talked about this image of a rowing team and the captain of the rowboat called the coxswain. In this image of people hard at work rowing but not knowing where they're headed, which is why they have to keep their eyes and ears focused on the captain in the boat. I thought to myself, what a beautiful image of what I'm trying to convey in this sermon series. That as we strain ahead and move into waters that we cannot see, that are often unpredictable, we keep our eyes and ears focused squarely on Jesus. And we listen, and we learn, because discipleship is hard work, isn't it? But we have a captain, and I'm so grateful for that reminder. Thank you, Monica. So, focus forward from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. This is the Word of God for us, the people of God. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him by saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Let's pray. Faithful God, once again, we gather around the symbols of water and of word and of table, and we remind ourselves that we don't belong to anyone other than you, for you have called us, and this morning, O God, you have chosen us. Pour through me now the gift of teaching, of preaching, and imagination as we live into this story, for it is in your name that I pray, amen. When I take a text and I think about you, I try to allow that text to sit with me. And this week, as I sat with Matthew and with Jesus by the Jordan, there was a song that kept ringing in my ears. It was a song that I would sing in high school, not necessarily with my singing youth group, but with my chorus. And then in college, as we recorded spirituals, I was reminded of the power of these words. I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me. All along life's pilgrim journey. I want Jesus to walk with me. Songs deep from the soul of those who needed a reminder that Jesus was with them. Even when it felt like the wilderness was everywhere. We know the wilderness, don't we? We're in a wilderness season. 
It doesn't take an expert to feel like the election has thrown us into a season of uncertainty where we're just wandering around as a country. But even here at the Highland Oaks Church, it's been a wilderness these last few weeks when we lost our dear friend and brother Dan Page. And then, of course, the COVID numbers begin to climb, and we're left to wonder, are we going to be wearing masks for the rest of our entire life? And we think to ourselves, dear God, I sure hope not. And so we listen for voices of encouragement. We even go to Starbucks or to craft stores, and we hear Christmas music playing on November the 7th or the 8th. And I'm reminded of one of my favorite characters in a TV show that just recently won a lot of Emmys, Moira Rose, when she talks to her son, David, and she says, David, don't be such a disgruntled pelican. Or, or maybe she, you, you could hear it better if you heard it in her accent. Don't be such a disgruntled pelican, David. This, this response of just kind of get over it, quit looking so disgruntled. Don't you wish getting out of the wilderness were that easy? That we could just hear Christmas music or some TV character say, just chill, relax. It's all good. But when you're in the wilderness, it's hard to feel like there's any good. You just keep your eyes focused somewhere. And this morning we hear the words from the African-American spiritual, and we beg Jesus to be with us. And the good news from Matthew's story is that Jesus is with us in the wilderness. It's right there. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. We're familiar with this story, aren't we? You know, as a kid, I used to love going to children's classes and watching this thing called a flannel graph. And Betty Lukens, bless her heart, whoever she is, I've never met her, created some wonderful visuals for little old Pat Bills. And there Jesus was in the wilderness. And I can remember this figure known as Satan or the devil, or maybe you know the one as the accuser, the one that presents lies, comes to Jesus in the wilderness. And of course, Jesus is hungry. And the Bible teacher would ask, well, you know what it's like to be hungry? And we were like, yes, we do. We're hungry right now. Would you please get on with it? <laughs> and then, of course, Jesus met the accuser, the tempter, with strong words of Scripture. It is written. Well, the devil says, Jesus, just throw yourself off this cliff or just turn these stones into bread. And Jesus responds once again, it is written. It's almost as if Jesus is inviting us to Hobby Lobby to buy scriptural wall art. Don't forget the power of scripture. And I'm not discounting that, by the way. Memorizing scripture. Living into this Deuteronomy 6 space where we tie them as symbols on our hands and on our foreheads, marking the door frames of our houses with the words of God. This is a way that Jesus met the tempter or the accuser in the wilderness. But what if there was something else here? And it's not just about what Jesus said, but it's about what Jesus heard. For the next 10 to 12 minutes, I want to share something with you that I think might be one of the most important things I could possibly share. Now, you may think that's quite a sales job coming from the preacher, but I can assure you that it wasn't just Scripture memorization that sustained Jesus in the wilderness. It was also the voice of the author of the story of Scripture that Jesus heard right before he went into the wilderness that sustained him in this season, just like God is sustaining you and me. Chapter 4, verse 1, what's the very first word in your Bible? In the original language, it's an adverb. It's the word then. 
Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit. You see, Matthew doesn't just put the word then there because it's a convenient grammatical, you know, sentence structure. It's signaling to us that there's a before and after of what's about to happen. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit. Well, what happened before then? It's the baptism of Jesus. Jesus comes to John, and you know how the story goes, to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus needed to be obedient to teach us a lesson on obedience, right? I know this story well. When I was baptized at the tender age of 10, I can say with great confidence it was a definite act of my obedience to a God that invited me into a space to claim my faith as my own. Whew, the water was cold. It was December 20th, 1987. I'll save you the math. I'm 43. But as I was baptized, I remember coming up out of the water and seeing my dad and my granddad smiling, beaming with pride. And I thought to myself, so this is what it feels like to be fully loved. Which is unfortunate because I placed way too much emphasis on what I was doing rather than what God had just done. Because if you listen, Jesus is in a submissive posture. Jesus didn't baptize himself. That's significant because you can't baptize yourself. You're giving up. You're saying, I can't do this anymore. And then a voice from heaven thunders from above and reminds Jesus, you are my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus goes into the wilderness. It's not just what Jesus does in the wilderness, it's what sustains him because of what he just heard. He heard a message from a relational God that said, you are mine. You are so loved. And with you, I am so well pleased. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have this story at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Placement is everything. Before Jesus teaches anyone, before Jesus heals the blind or sets the captives free, before Jesus heads towards Jerusalem, he has to hear these words, You are mine. You're the beloved. With you I am well pleased. Beloved. The Greek word agapetos. It means to be divinely loved. Loved in a divine way. And the sad truth about love in a divine way is that we often equate our relationships here among us, here in our past, here in our families, with what the relationship with God's love must be like. And for some of us, that's a really hard leap to take because... The way we have understood love has been misunderstood through abuse and ridicule and inappropriate uses of power. But God is here reminding Jesus, not because of what He has done, but because of who He is. You are divinely loved. God is continuing the story of Jesus in the wilderness. And most commentators will tell you this is a story that's mirroring how Israel missed the point in their own wilderness. Jesus is in the wilderness to show Israel once again what it's like to be in the wilderness. Go all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Go there if you can, because chapter 6 begins with the Shema, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul strength and mind. Talk about these things when you walk along the road. Tie them on your foreheads. Paint them on your door frames. Because, chapter 7, verse 6, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on earth to be His people, His treasured possession. Agapetos. 
it was not because you were more numerous than any other people that the Lord set His heart on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. It was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that He swore to your ancestors that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand, redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who maintains covenant loyalty. If you don't hear anything else this morning, hear that. Israel was assured that God picked them. God picked chose them. Why? Because He loved them with deep and abiding affection. And if you need any more proof, go to Deuteronomy chapter 1. In the very opening verses it says, these are the words that the Lord gave to Moses to speak to the Israelites when they were in the wilderness. Huh. People who are in the wilderness need to be reminded that they've been chosen. That God has not forgotten them. That they are so loved. You are the sons and daughters of God. With you, God is so well pleased. God has not forgotten you. God will not abandon you. Max Licato, one of my favorite Christian authors, once said that if God had a calendar, your birthday would be circled. I like that thought. So in our house, we have a calendar that sits to the right of our refrigerator on a wall. It's one of those Thomas Kincaid calendars where you can switch out the months and the dates And for the dates, they have different tiles that can be replaced for whatever month you are in. Like in July, they have a July 4th tile for the celebration of Independence Day. And of course, for December on the 25th, they have a Christmas tile. And in November, they of course have a Thanksgiving tile. But according to our family, there are different months of the year that contain special tiles. Why? Because of birthdays. So last week... I changed the calendar, and we were having dinner last week, and we were gathered around the dinner table, and my youngest son, Andrew, says, Dad, where's November 30th? And I said, it's right there, son, and then I realized exactly what I had done. I had forgotten to put Andrew's happy birthday tile in the calendar, and he noticed And I don't tell you that story to tell you that I'm a terrible father. But to share with you the power of reminders. And we need to know deep within our bones that there is a God that doesn't forget us. God has chosen you. You want to know how to focus forward in this wilderness season? Hear these words. You are my son and daughter, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Let those who have ears to hear, hear these words of God.